Welcome to uh, another one of the conversations, the Miami Corona Project Conversations. Today, I'm really honored to be uh, having a conversation with two of my colleagues at the University of Miami, uh, two colleagues who I actually work with a lot as part of a, a team that looks at the issue of climate change and climate migration from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. Uh, uh, we have with us uh, Catherine Mock, who uh, is over at the uh, Rosensteel School, and she's going to introduce herself a little bit. And we also have with us um, Jessica Ali, who's going to also introduce herself. She's over at the School of Law. And we uh, meet on a regular basis. We actually have conversations on a weekly basis about how um, uh, climate impact is going to uh, have us address issues of climate migration over time. And I just thought it'd be an opportune moment for us to have a conversation about our specific research, but through the prism of how the world and Miami is responding to this pandemic. So uh, welcome, welcome both. I'm so happy to have you with, uh, have you here in this conversation. So uh, welcome, Catherine. Catherine, could you just tell us a little bit, just a, a little bit about your work and your, and your research, just to, to put it so that the, you know, the folks listening have a little understanding of the work you do as a climate scientist? Great. My work is really focused on the risks of a changing climate and how societies are managing those risks. In all of the projects that I think about, usually I am trying to do two things. Number one, developing an integrative perspective to understand risks that matter to people and nature. You've got to draw together the social, ecological, environmental components together. And I'm also really interested in the way that knowledge can inform decision making and policy. So that means I work on a lot of different topics. Climate migration and retreat is a big area of focus for me, but also human security in a changing climate, justice and climate change responses, and all of the different ways that knowledge can become actionable for ongoing decision-making processes. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Jessica? Yeah, so uh, thanks. Lovely to talk to you guys. As always, I work in the law school but I bring more than a legal dimension to my work. I'm chiefly interested in climate change and how it impacts land. Uh, and But my idea of land goes beyond just the physical properties of the land itself to extend to the, the people that live on that land and the creatures that live on the land and the ecosystem. So I have kind of for several years now been really interested in the intersections of environmental law, climate change and property law actually, and looking at what types of uh, undertakings, what types of laws, policies, both public and private endeavors we can engage in to try and navigate this really tricky road ahead of us. So that brings me into um, thinking about climate migration as well as, as we do with our group, but also I, I end up thinking about kind of all the different ways that we plan or don't plan uh, for climate change. So what, what do each of us, uh, you know, see insofar as the, this pandemic, how this pandemic uh, um, is impacting us, our policymakers, the way we see our vulnerabilities and our risks, and maybe connect them to the broader conversation of climate change. I mean, some things are, are, are pretty obvious. Deforestation, I think, is, is, uh, has an obvious connection between climate change, right? The, the destruction of forests that normally sequester carbon and uh, keep habitats in place, uh, not only um, contribute to uh, climate change by not being able to capture that carbon, but they also cause animals to move from their habitats into other places. And those animals uh, who are now in distress moving out of their normal habitat due to deforestation to other areas uh, can connect with animals that they wouldn't have connected with before and with humans and cause the human animal transition, uh, transmission. So as you can see, that's just one example of how climate change land and um, this pandemic are connected, as are our, our responses to it. There's a, a, a lot of air pollution. The, you know, one, I, I read one micro, uh, microgram of uh, a pollutant in a square meter air makes death to COVID 15% more likely. But regardless, just intuitively, we know that you know, the more polluted the, the air is, the, the lesser our capacity to breathe. And you know, this COVID virus is at, at its core, uh, dealing with people's respiratory issues. Again, climate deforestation, emissions of pollutants into the atmosphere um, are connected to our climate change cause, but similarly <laughs> uh, connected to pandemics. So I think there are very obvious and clear connections between the, 
the pandemic and the conversations that the three of us and the rest of our team have on a regular basis on climate and its impact. I'm just wondering if this vulnerability to uh, the pandemic uh, helps us understand our broader vulnerability to climate and what the connections are. And, I, and just a broad, open conversation with all of us just to talk and have the public listening in. Catherine, you have some ideas on that maybe? I know that in your work, your work around, uh, around uh, uh, justice, your work around the issues of, of uh, human security. I mean, <laughs> I think our planet feels exceedingly insecure at this very moment. We don't know when we're gonna go back to normalcy. And those are around the broader climate issues. But any, any ideas or thoughts you may have on the conversation? Yeah, no, I think all of those things are really things that have come to mind. For me, it's definitely been a time to think deeply about the profound transformation that's happened in the world. And I've got some points of purchase where I see connections to some of the transformations underway related to climate change, and then other ways that there are just big differences. So, I mean, first of all, this is a transformation unlike anything that has occurred in my lifetime, for sure. And you've got to go back many decades to think about something that societally, economically, and in terms of health was as rapidly, as profoundly um, transformational for societies globally. I think one thing that's kind of interesting is that this is definitely a scenario that the world has prepared for to some degree, right? Pandemic planning is something that happens through public health systems, through international collaboration, through local government preparations. But there's something about the lived experience that is just so much more real and where the things that are radically transforming what daily life is like for so many people were, you know, a hypothetical line of plan or something that had been explored in this scenario and how that lived experience is so different from just kind of a concept of something that might happen in the future. And I think there are a lot of parallels there where we think about climate scenarios that could happen. Do we really, really deeply internalize what they would be like? No. And I think that for me has been a big uh, thing I've been thinking about. Um, I also think the degree to which we see how interconnected all aspects of society are, right? This is not just public health. This is economics. This is social vulnerability. This is, as you were describing so nicely, Xavier, multiple stressors happening at once. You know, if it's the disease burden or inequality that already exists, and then you layer a pandemic on top of that, you're revealing a lot of drivers of inequality and other stressors that are already there in the backdrop. So I guess the, the line I always say for climate change is we're not going to craft the global economy to solve climate change, but it's certainly something where we have stopped the global economy to address the public health crisis we're facing right now. And I think that's a really clear indicator of the, the current danger that societies are grappling with. Jessica? Wow, you guys brought up so many interesting <laughs> points there. I feel like we could talk about this forever. I'm going to kind of go in order which is uh, of, of how you said things, which is maybe going to seem scattered. Um, first of all, um, you know, I think a lot about endangered species. So Xavier, I'm, I'm glad you started off with talking about the kind of the species and forest issues here. Um, it, I've been teaching both in endangered species and kind of pollution control this semester. So these things have been really interesting to engage with my graduate students on and, and how it really is bringing home some of the issues that we talk about in class. That's like, you know, why do we care so much about trade of endangered species and what are these aspects? And, and to see the, the impacts of these things on the ground for them, I think is, uh, for all of us, is has been uh, sobering. But the pollution control um, and the those aspects, I just wanted to think about that a little bit more with you guys. You know, the there's so many elements going on here. One of the things that's been interesting is that it helps people actually understand kind of invisible pollution a little bit better. If we talk about some of the intersections we see, you know, I, some of the drawings that have been done for kind of how the COVID spreads in the air and why you need to stay six feet away have actually been helpful for um, um, explaining to people the impacts of air pollution. Why is it that this like thing that you can't see in the air is really kind of hurting kids and, and making their asthma worse? You know, it looks like we have clear skies um, and yet we have these health problems. So it's not the same type of health problem, but understanding kind of the dispersal within the air has been um, kind of illuminating for some people. And I think that the, the combination of these factors on top of each other show us kind of um, 
it just emphasizes who get, who's vulnerable in these situations, right? Now we know that people who actually already have respiratory distress, and often that could because, be, can because they're already exposed to pollution, are now going to be even more impacted from these types of things. And so there's no question that, that just across our society that there will be unequal distribution of these impacts. That ha makes me think a little bit about some of our conversations we have about climate migration and, and who the resilient communities are. Like our resilient communities here, we're really seeing that illustrated well. You know, the people who are wealthy and who have big yards or, or can travel somewhere else to kind of their second home that's more secluded, that can afford to have all of their things delivered to them so they don't themselves have to go out and interact, right? It's, it's a different question, but it shows us how kind of wealthier segments of our society can really uh, weather these storms, whether it's, you know, climate change or a pandemic, that they have these, these uh protections and this resiliency built in because of that. And it's something that I hope we think about, not just in this kind of public health crisis, but in all our crises and how, how we can kind of spread that across. I really like kind of your thoughts about thinking about um, how connected we all are together and how that really illustrates it. Um, you know, that we see the kind of connections between all of the economic sectors and, um, and like climate change, we do have something here that will have, we have worldwide impacts. That is not something we've had for um, many of our, our other environmental problems that we've seen action on. So this is, that is something that um, I, I can hope that maybe we learn lessons about kind of how to work together, communicate better and share science at least, if not other um, strategies. Yeah, at that at that um, uh, local and global level, look, hi, Aaliyah, uh, you've heard me talk a lot about that in our conversations. We we care about sea level rise and climate migration issues uh, clearly across our entire community. But um, I'm more concerned with the non-obvious ones. It's obvious that there's sea level rise at the water's edge at the beach and at the at, at the bay where most of our expensive properties are. But the hot spot in the state today isn't Orlando, it isn't St. Petersburg, it isn't Tampa, it's the city of Hialeah. It has more cases, 700 since Friday, of COVID than those metropolitan areas. And what is Hialeah? Mostly working class and poor people, mostly elderly, mostly monolinguistic, who are not being taken care of. There's people still doing yard work. When they're doing yard work, they're not doing signs. Who's doing yard work? The poor, the people who are day laborers. And bringing it back to climate change, just like people in Hialeah and day laborers impact the rest of the community, the issue of climate, what's gonna to happen to our economy when whole swaths of Miami-Dade can't save themselves, is the problem that keeps me up at night. That's the reason I'm in this group with you guys. It's like the the the, the pandemic, uh, the catastrophe exacerbates, exposes actually what is right in front of our eyes now. And I just hope that when we get out of this, uh, once there's a vaccine, when we get out of this, that we begin as a society thinking about things informed by science, but looking at the vulnerabilities. And the reason I, I wanted to talk to both of you is because I, I think that the vulnerabilities are going to be a whole lot bigger than the one that we're facing right now. I think bigger problems are to come. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about about that. And also, you know, I don't want to drive the conversation. Let's, let's all just keep it flowing. And, and I think let's feel free to sort of interrupt each other the way we do in a, in a normal conversation. Does someone want to bring in? Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll take you up on that, which is that, you know, one of the things that's um, you know, interesting here is that we have a public health crisis with a very specific virus, right? And we can study that virus and we can understand that virus. It might take a while. It's, I'm not saying this is easy, easy, but I'm just saying we have a very known quantity of what the problem is. Climate change is going to be so much worse because it's not that one question. And, and this is hard, right? This is hard. This is like, how do, how do, we, how do we figure out how to test people? How do we get uh, materials about? How do we kind of function the society? But now imagine that that's just one of the questions. 
But then there's also these other effects that we don't know how they're going to play out. We don't know uh, where the sea levels are going to rise. We don't know where the storms are going to come. We don't know the impact on crops. We don't know how many more diseases are coming in. So this is why we have to learn the lessons now of how to create response systems. Yeah, totally. And running with that, I mean, I think, okay, so in terms of putting heat trapping emissions into the atmosphere, that's something that we can measure pretty well. And we can calculate, you know, how much warmer the planet is likely to get. And we also can recognize that we're not making very much progress in reducing our emissions of heat trapping gases. But then everything that Jesse was just saying, in terms of how people will actually be affected, it's all aspects of human life simultaneously, right? It's our food, it's our water, it's ecosystems, it's urban areas and rural areas, and the way all of these will play against the existing backdrop of vulnerability that is uneven, capabilities that are uneven. So I think that is really interesting for me to consider. And also then kind of what will be catastrophic for societies and the degree to which it's actually kind of hard to know. In many cases, it's you know pretty middle of the road climate change scenarios will have impacts, whether it's sea level rise in some places or increased heat events or desertification in other places that will be catastrophic for communities in those areas. And you don't even have to go to really high end climate change scenarios. That's pretty much middle of the road. So for me, a lot of this is, okay, we knew a pandemic is something that will happen uh, with some likelihood into the future and we're living it now. With climate change, similarly, there are all these different things that we know will happen with some likelihood into the future and we're just letting them be far off possibilities without really getting serious about what that means for reducing emissions of heat trapping gases now and making sure we're simultaneously prepared to grapple with the impacts in store. How do we let that sense of urgency that all of us are feeling now, like on a dime, actually it wasn't a dime, it was at a month, about a month to six weeks late, but on a pseudo dime, we, um, you know, sort of responded to um, this pandemic in the United States and Congress allocated some funding and, and for the most part, not everyone, you know, there's some people who still um, want to go outside, understand that there's an immediate uh, and present threat and danger to us. So we are social distancing, we are staying at home and everyone sort of gets it that, that there's a problem. How do we um, create that sense of urgency vulnerability uh, with the rest of our society post this pandemic? I mean, I, I think as you've seen, there's a lot of people who are using single use plastics. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of steps that we've taken back just as this pandemic happened because it's the sense of urgency and immediacy forget recycling, forget all this. It's like, let's just, you know, stay healthy. So I'm just wondering, how do we begin to, as we normalize, um, not forget what we felt and let our, our fellow neighbors understand, hey, there's a sense of urgency right now. We may have a vaccine, but we're nowhere out of, out of the woods yet. Well, I mean, I feel like that's, uh, I feel like that, it's going to be so hard because I, for those of us sitting here, we have already felt that sense of urgency and we have been advocating and preaching that. Look, you know, Greta is like screaming at us, right, to feel this sense of urgency. You know, people who work in the climate realm are always trying to be like, how can we, uh, everybody always looks to World War II as the last time people actually kind of came together and struggled against things and felt themselves on a common page. And, um, or look at the fires in Australia, right? So the people in Australia are totally devastated. They recognize this problem. And even there, they can't get government action. So I am with you that this is like, this hopefully would be a lesson for people that it doesn't help to bury our head in the sand. But I, I do feel like we have had a lot of preaching of the sense of urgency and it hasn't been working. I would be really happy if you guys had some optimistic view of this actually turning around now. Catherine. Yeah, I think it's the multi trillion dollar question, literally. Um, I mean, I think, okay, to go as hopeful as I can, I would say, you know, compared to say three decades ago in the space of climate change adaptation or increasing preparedness for the impacts in store, we're seeing a lot of progress. So we can point to cities, states, countries, different sectors across the globe that are taking actions towards becoming more prepared for climate change. 
I think the, the caveat, though, would be that mostly to date, that has been in the space of planning, and we're seeing relatively little implementation of actual actions that are different. And in particular, of the things that have happened, they tend to be fairly incremental, you know, um, making sure our drainage is a little bit better, making sure our homes, some places are elevated, making sure our food security systems have supply chains that are a little bit more robust to drought. But we haven't necessarily done the kind of fundamental rethinking of a lot of our societal approaches at the rate or scale that we'll need to into the future. So I think that's the real question of how do we go from absolutely a ton of progress globally to progress that needs to be a lot bigger, a lot faster. I think in many ways it's about um, changing behaviors and patterns, right? I mean, I don't know how long we're going to be self, you know, you know, living quarantine in our own homes, um, but you know, it may be months. It may be more than months. The Florida Surgeon General uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, uh, basically in an open meeting, said, "Look, we may be wearing masks for a year." So if there are behaviors that change, and one of those behaviors is um, a diminishing of what we consume, maybe not the kind of way we're eating food, but even that, even being more mindful about how much food there is or where our food is coming from, who provides our food to us, what the value are of different people in society. If we're a little bit more mindful of that. If we're a little bit more mindful about what we wear, or how much we really have to travel or what we need to do. In other words, if, if we, if we start living, uh, after we have a vaccine in ways that we were forced to live while we didn't have a vaccine. And if our mindset understands that, that, and let's just put fear into the equation that there's a worse virus, a more contagious virus, a more fatal virus out there because we continue engaging in environmental degradation, because habitats are shifting northward, because populations of animals are where they weren't before, because disease can be transmitted easier that way because we are exploding in our population, that there is a bigger coronavirus out there for us, then maybe after living in this, after having 20 million people have no jobs, after having millions of Americans infected, after having tens of thousands, hopefully not hundreds of thousands, hopefully tens of thousands of Americans die just here, maybe American policymakers will be responding to a constituency that says, not again, guys, Let's get our stuff together. And maybe every other country in the world does it. I know that sounds idealistic, but to see it in any other way just keeps us vulnerable. So it's, it's to me, it's how do we connect the climate crisis to this? Because I believe that this is part of the climate crisis, that this particular pandemic is part of a broader um, human impact on the environment. Uh, in this case, through the transmission of a disease. We don't know exactly how um, that virus went from animal to human, but we have some clues. But more than that, we know that other diseases have done that in the past, right? Where humans have gone into um, situations that aren't at the rhythm of nature. And if we also take, I think, this entire pandemic and understand that there's only one organism on earth, it's called life, and we're all part of that one organism, that if we keep on chopping its limbs, sooner or later, one of the organs, one of the tissues, one of the limbs called the human species is going to be vulnerable too. So we can't just go there and, you know, sort of, you know, machete away uh, at, at the thing that built us as part of a natural system. So I don't know, these are really complex, almost philosophical conversations, but our society needs to have a new way of thinking so that it has a new way of behaving. And I just think that by uh, letting us own and understand the fear and the sense of sacrifice that we're enduring right now uh, into future actions might be a way of taking us there. I don't know. What do you What do you guys think? I mean, I'm sometimes helpful that we have kind of learned that it isn't maybe as bad as we thought. And what I mean by that is that we can come together, like we know how to do it. We can come together, we can make changes. We can make changes that seemed unthinkable when we decide that something is really important. If we can find money, we had no idea we had, right? When we realize that the problem, when we really decide that that's what our priority is. And, and, and so in that way, I think 
um, there's a hopefulness, I, I feel, particularly any point that we've created some structural change that will actually facilitate uh, more distance um, event, you know, you won't have to travel as much. We can have more people from working home. We can kind of uh, shop less frequently. Like those kind of structural changes that could could actually also yield um, climate um, changes are, are good ones and they might stay in place. But I also worry that there's gonna be a real push to get kind of the economy back on its feet that we're going to actually kind of weaken some of our standards. I was just today reading um, about the 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 push beginning of the late 90s, but going all the way up until about 2005, 2006 to try and change the ozone rules. As we gained a lot of information about ground level ozone and realized how much it was really hurting children and how really bad it was for asthmatics and all these things. Um, even the Obama administration came out and said, this is too hard for our economy. You know, so even even uh, really like what we thought of as being environmentally friendly was really hesitant. I mean, we get the rules in the end, but it took like 10 years because of the fear on the economy of something we had really kind of good signs behind. And just reading that yesterday just made me so worried for today. You know, what do we, what do we think is going to happen today? A lot of like, who cares about that plastic ban anymore? And who cares about, oh, if they, if the power plant's emitting more than we thought, we, we got to get moving. Yeah, no, and I, I think there are two points that really stood out there. You know, I think it, oftentimes it's cast as it's the economy or the environment, but usually those are pretty strongly intertwined. And I think the theme that Good we've point. been working with already is, okay, when the, the air is clean, who is experiencing that clean air versus who is bearing the burden of living near the power plants that are creating asthma in children? Um, I also think this question of kind of, a vibrant future where people do well uh, and the degree to which there's a potential for rebound after indeed our current drop in emissions. What we have seen historically is that usually after recession, emissions jump up even further compared to where they were initially. So I think really kind of internalizing the profound change that is happening now, that can be empowering if we actually find how resilient we are and how we can support each other even in a current moment that is very hard. And I think the real question moving forward is how do we keep those lessons in place as compared to what Jesse's describing, just letting it all fall by the wayside. I think if we have a food issue, right, if, if you, you, we see the news about uh, Tyson chicken having so many of its workers infected and we see what's happening with slaughterhouses, um, maybe that gets some people to start thinking about more plant-based um, uh, diets, but also it may have some people think about maybe slow food, about how is it, you know, how is it that we can um, uh, prepare for this in the future? I don't know. I, I, just, I just hope that there's something here that makes us rethink. I know, that, for instance, that, that care workers are going to be, um, health care workers are going to be from here on out, you know, honored as much as our veterans are for their service and dedication, you know, that they're, that they're understood. And that's a pretty obvious one, but you know what? So are the people who work in our grocery shops. And I don't know, there might be a different, there might be a different uh, day. I just think that we need some, some leadership to take us there. Right before having this call, I was in a, on, a, on another call with uh, the Comparative International Education Society, and I was challenging us in that, in that call to use our wisdom and, 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 and the tools that we have as educators to try to, to bring this new paradigm, this new way of thinking to our classrooms uh, so that we do build a different kind of society. I just, I don't think that it's going to happen organically. I guess that's what I'm trying to argue. I think that, that um, sadly, it's almost, you know what it almost feels like to me? Like you're, you're almost in a car accident, but you weren't in one. It could have been a fatal one. You could have literally died. But by the time you're two blocks down, your heart rate is back to normal and you forgot about that. And I'm sort of fearing that that's what this pandemic is going to do. So what I want to do is show that little movie of what almost happened to you and let you know that this thing's gonna happen in two blocks unless you put that cell phone down, stop texting and pay attention. I don't know. There's something about this moment that I think needs some curated experience, some some way of having 
thinkers and community and uh, you know educators and policymakers come together and go way 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 you know we became more vulnerable than we had to be what do we do to prevent this from happening and I, I don't know I hope that we at the university our colleagues at the university are working on this can come up with some wisdom around that well it's been a uh, it's been really great talking to to both of you um, you know I uh, I'm happy to to continue talking, but I think we've had a really, really good chat. Do, do you, either of you want to have like a little closing comment, just some reflections on it? It could be from a professional level or also just from a personal level. Just what are you feeling at this at this moment and maybe what uh, what you'd like for us to come up to and do on the other side or whatever whatever you want to talk. But I just want to thank you both for, you know, for for being a part of this. And I want to bring some closure to it by just having you both have the last word. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess just uh, for me, it's been a, a remarkable time to kind of be empathetic with the range right now. Right. The range is insane. It ranges from the IC unit, unit uh, under unbearable stress in the current moment, um, families where that recovery is been tenuous or they're getting there, families with real hardship in terms of health limitations that put certain individuals at greater risk, all the way through to the strong economic ripples and the degree to which those may be very long lasting. And then at the same time, there are ways that this current moment might be bringing some families closer together with a lot more time um, and ability to kind of share experiences and find and remember what's important in terms of their family social relationships. So it's it's been a massive transformation. I think one that has given us all a lot to reflect on. And I do hope some of those kind of points of realization are things we can carry forward, recognizing that, you know, we probably can drive a lot less. We probably can do without a lot of those things we would just want to buy for buying sake. Uh, we can find satisfaction spending time in the kitchen in ways that we might forget on a daily basis. So there's something about the slowing down and the priority on safety and well-being that I think is a healthy reminder for everyone, uh, especially those who have privilege to be contemplating these things right now and not grappling with the immediate impact. Yeah, thank you. That was actually very, very sweet and thoughtful, maybe making me think a little bit better about my my home life right now. I was already talking to you guys earlier about just how hard this is right now and um, uh, work-wise. And, and I, I'm so jealous of if I see one more person making sourdough bread and I think, oh my gosh, how I, I would love to have the time to do that or to read um, the, the novel I've been like sitting there waiting to read. Um, for some of us, this is busier time than, than ever um, between um, work and family. And I think in particular, maybe for those of us who work in this realm who are really trying to take action on it. So every time I'm 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 working hard and, and, and getting frustrated, it is so, uh, helpful for me to know that, that 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 this is actually all going towards something and that there actually should be some kind of optimism um, um, out there that we actually can take some solace from this hard work that we're doing in these hard times and think that this actually could lead to some of those changes that we have been kind of um, hoping for and working towards. So I, I've been optimistic a few times in this conversation, but I want you guys to know that uh, that I do almost every evening. I, I sit there and I think, you know what? There's a reason we're doing this, and it and it is going to help in the end. Thank thank you both for taking time and for your wisdom and for your research. And I'm um, I'm so happy to be able to meet with you on a weekly basis to talk <laughs> about these issues. Um, thanks so much, and um, stay safe and healthy. Yeah, you too. Bye, guys. Thank Thanks. you, Xavier, for the conversation.